is CGTN, China Global Television Network. For the first time, a Hollywood movie featuring African superheroes has swept global box offices, reaping over a billion dollars in just a few weeks. The phenomenal success of Black Panther has become the latest hype in the global movie scene and creates a lot of debate and excitement, particularly here in Africa. So will Black Panther change how African stories are portrayed in movies? Can Wakanda's success be replicated here in Africa? Joining me today is Wanuri Kahiu, a celebrated Kenyan film director, producer, public speaker, and author. In 2009, her sci-fi feature, Pumzi, garnered 11 out of 24 nominations at the 5th Africa Film Academy Awards. Since then, Wanuri has made her mark as a pioneering African storyteller, envisioning Africa in the future, where science becomes part and parcel of the African narrative. This week on Talk Africa, we're in conversation with Wanuri Kahiu to talk about her works, African Woman in Film, Afrofuturism and Black Panther. I'm Lindy Mtongana. Welcome to the special edition of Talk Africa. Thank you so much for joining us on Talk Africa this week. A warm welcome to the program. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Well, of course, when do people describe you as an award-winning African female filmmaker? Just talk us through how you got your start in this industry and how you carved out your path of success. Um, so I started filmmaking a long time ago. Or well, rather, the passion for filmmaking started a long time ago. I was about 16 when I walked into an edit studio and I walked in and it's the first time that I realized that people make TV. <laughs> it just never occurred to me before that that, that, that was an actual job. Mm. So once I realized that people make it, I just thought, that's it, this is what I want to do. I want to be one of the creators of TV. Because mm. uh, it combined both of my passions. I was a bookworm and I was a tele addict and it gave me a reason <laughs> to watch TV and to live in this world of creation. So Has I loved it. it. I mean, as a woman, has that journey been difficult at times? I always say I've never known any other journey because I've never been a man to compare it with. <laughs> so I've only known this one thing, and I've always been passionate about being a filmmaker. And a filmmaker from this region is hard regardless of your sex. It's incredibly hard to be a filmmaker and to try and like, pursue it. It's, it's as much heartbreak as it is anything else. What are, what are some of the obstacles that you've had to encounter along the way? Well, first, it's just socially. Socially, artists are not really always viewed in a positive light, you know? Uh, an artist is not somebody who you brag to your friends about all the time, unless they absolutely make it, and then you're lucky. Mm -hmm. But before that, it's, it's almost, it's, it, it has a, it ha being an artist has very negative connotations on, uh, in Kenya, at the very least. Um, so just being able to say, this is what I want to do. I don't want to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or something that you know, people value. I, I wanted to be a filmmaker, and, and that had no context. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's hard explaining to your family and your friends that's what, that's what you want to do first. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I have very supportive friends, and my family have come along the journey with me now. But I still have aunts who say, so you still do that video thing? <laughs> You're still doing that video? Yeah, do yeah. you do wedding videos? <laughs> Which is not like, it's a whole, <laughs> yeah. I think filmmaking uh, to many is just reduced to being uh, somebody who can shoot wedding videos. Yeah, exactly. And of course, in East Africa, or in of course, many parts of Africa, one of the key challenges is funding. How have you encountered that? Yeah, funding is a huge problem on this side, um, especially because at the moment we don't, the government is just beginning to recognize the, or take ownership of the filmmakers and, and, and the role that they play in a society. So we haven't had a lot of government support, um, but I see that beginning to change. Uh, but it is, it's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes years and years and years to find financing for films. It, it always has, um, and you kind of, you get them from different places. Yeah. Um, so, but hopefully, I'm, I'm really encouraged that we, hopefully, it looks like we're working towards co-production agreements with other countries. And once that starts, then we're able to have 
ease of financing between different countries. And coming back to the continent, do you think to some extent that the, the African um, cultural agenda um, is to a large extent still determined by funders? Unfortunately, at the moment, because we so heavily rely on either uh, donor funding or policy-driven funding to create art, a lot of our art is still agenda-driven. So we, there, there needs to be, we don't have, um, not many African countries have the backing of their government that allows artists to kind of explore or, or to experiment. Uh, that's, that's still very limited. So there needs to be an emphasis of, of creating money for people who just want to mm -hmm. create mm -hmm. non-agenda art. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that we so firmly believe in creating an Afro bubblegum space where we can encourage people to invest in art for art's sake so that we have a culture that is not dependent on donor funding or policy that just purely comes from imagination and, and, and perhaps a new culture mm -hmm. of art that is driven by the people rather than driven than by the policy mm. makers. And just tell us a little bit more about your genre of films, the kind of films that you most enjoy working on. I recently have started to say that the, my genre of films is Afro bubblegum because it celebrates fun, fierce, and frivolous African life mm -hmm. in all of its essence. So my genre of film is, is trying to create work that is not issue driven, that is not message driven, but just shows like a slice of life in, in Kenya or a slice of life wherever you are in Zimbabwe or wherever, you know? So it's really joy filled and hopeful work from Africa has become my genre. And um, I dabble in different other genres within that, within the Afro bubblegum bubble, which is I, I, I'll make some science fiction, I'll write science fiction, or I'll play with fantasy, or I'll play with love stories, or documentaries that give me joy. Mm -hmm. But my first and primary focus is creating beautiful and joyful images of Africans. Mm. And that is so important. And we'll get to, to, to more on that in just a moment. But I just kind of want to look more at, at genres for a minute. I mean, you mentioned uh, science fiction. And I know you, you've spoken about this before, where people have asked you, how do you blend African stories with science fiction? And your answer to that has been, the two have never been apart. Perhaps just explain that a bit more, and perhaps from your view, what are these uh, science fiction roots of African storytelling? The science and science fiction and, and mythology and, and even spiritualism have never been apart from African stories. They've always been very deeply incorporated in them. So even when we start to study creation myths from the places that we come from, wherever we come from, we have some extravagant creation myths about how we came to be as people. And even within those creation myths, there's elements of science fiction. There's elements of fantasy. There's elements of mythical realism. And they're all kind of combined together. Mm. And it's only recently when we started to, to, to voice or to put words or con compartmentalize ideas into genres that we began to say, well, this is this and this is that. But for us, it's always existed seamlessly. I mean, uh, I mean th and there's many great examples. In South Africa, uh, you, there's, there's the, the tradition of uh, what Credo Mutua has kind of started talking about the reptilian races and you know so there's been that idea as a creation myth whether or not many people believe in it um, in in west africa we've had different people who have believed in um, like the dogan believed in that they were descendants of aliens from a planet so there have been different ideas of mythology and different ideas of science fiction that come from different parts of Africa. And it's only now that we're beginning to label them. And, and I mean, the other label that's becoming popular now is this term Afrofuturism. Is, is that different from, say, describing mythology as black science fiction? I think when the term Afrofuturism was first coined by Mark Derry, he was describing any black art that has Afro that has science fiction, speculative fiction, mythical realism, fantasy um, within it, mm. right? Um, so anything that, that kind of incorporated those themes and had people of color in them was, was considered Afrofuturism. And I believe that when that, that when that term was coined, mm. when that term was coined at the beginning, it was looking at African American art. And now, I think we've globally accepted it from people of, uh, of diverse 
diverse people of color have begun to incorporate it in their lives. Mm -hmm. So it's not only Af an, an African-American artistic experience. So when I refer to Afrofuturism, I, when I do, I really am referring to work that also originates from Africa. Mm -hmm. um, science fiction, mythical realism that originates from Africa as well. Um, so it's just kind of like pushing apart the limitations of what have become to be known as Afrofuturism and including what I believe are the roots of the word, which is the African culture and storytelling mm. and myths and legends. And just looking at some of your key characters, how important is it for you to, beyond uh, creating films that reflect happy African experiences, but what's your focus then um, in that regard on representation, on representing happy young Africans? I think it's quite broad. I try and represent all types of Africans. Um, and at the moment, I'm, I, I, I would love to say Africans because it's, it, it would be a more global sense or, or a more pan-African sense of the work that I'm creating. So I would really like to be a filmmaker that celebrates a pan-African experience and pan-African people of different of different natures, of different minority groups, of different sexualities, of different genders. It's really important to me that we have a holistic fabric of people that tell a, a more pan-African existence. Mm -hmm. Because every time I travel to a different part of Africa, I'm surprised by it. I'm surprised by the people who are there. It teaches me more about myself. It teaches me more about the continent. And it's always kind of unveiling itself in, in slow, really layered ways. And so there's so many stories to tell. So I want to be part of a tradition that tells Pan-African stories. And that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. But I'm also very, very firmly feminist. So I really like to tell stories where most of my lead characters are women. Um, and unless there's a reason not to, I try and get as many of my lead characters as women because it's, it's important. It's important that we have female representation. Why do you think it's important? Because we're not seeing enough of ourselves as role models. And I would love to see, and even for not only for my sake, I would love to also my daughter to grow up in a culture where it's, it's normal to see strong, dynamic, wide-ranging women. But so often, especially in cinema at the moment, the representations of women are quite limited. They're either one thing or another. You're either um, a wife, a mother, or something else, you know what I mean? And these very segregated, these very small niches of women, I don't even, don't even begin to scratch at the surface that is the complexity of the African women that I've known in my life. Mm -hmm. And I want to honor and represent them in my work. Mm, absolutely. Thank you so much, Wanuri. We'll certainly be back with uh, more conversation with uh, Wanuri Kahiu, all about African women in film and especially about Black Panther coming up next. China Global Television Network. From broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective. Six channels and a video content service. News when you want it and where you want it. On TV screens, websites, mobile platforms and social media. CGTN. See the difference. The world is changing. Soon there will only be the conquered. Welcome back to Talk Africa. We are in conversation with Wanuri Kahiu, and now we're going to talk about Black Panther, a movie, of course, that has just shaken everyone, really just been so phenomenally successful. Uh, over $1.2 billion now worldwide uh, in the first six weeks since it was released. In your view, Wanuri, what do you attribute its success to? I just think it was a great story. And not only was it a, is it a great superhero character, we love him. And also Killmonger was a great antagonist. Mm -hmm. But um, more than that, the story, there were, there were themes in that story that I had never seen in, in cinema before. There were issues that they were talking about that had never been dealt with in cinema before that I just thought were 
exciting. Um, it was a new place. And, and for, for a continent that has always been viewed as the other, we finally had a chance to, to kind of look at it in a beautiful, singularly pan-African way because we were able to combine so many different traditions and cultures in one mythical space mm -hmm. and pay homage to the whole continent mm. as a result. Mm. Uh, Did you think it was fair in that way, in, in terms of the way it tried to uh, pay homage to the continent? Do you think the way Africa is represented um, as Wakanda, do you think it does enough justice to the African story as we know it, as we live it, as we feel it as Africans? Well, I think that it's, it's, it's a great time to be paying attention to Africa and the different cultures that come from the continent. So while I kn it does stretch our imagination in the sense that it has many different ideas of Africa in one space, while that happens, at the same time, it tells a very kind of singular story about an imaginary country. And, and, and that's kind of cool because we, it gives us space to just kind of just play with, with what we've always considered stereotypes um, of, of, of the fantastical African, um, but, also, but also give it humanity at the same time. So I think that, that that interplay between what is real and what has been perceived as stereotypes before was actually a great tension that the, the director built into it. But one day I really am excited about that, uh, that same, same story being told by an African. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on that note, who gets to tell African stories in your view? I mean, at the end of the day, this was still a, a Marvel production. Um, originally, these characters were not written by black or African writers. They were written by, you know, white writers or American writers. So, yeah, who in your view gets to tell Africa stories? I don't think we have ownership of stories anymore. I think we're long past that period where we have ownership of stories. The only thing that I think we can add to it is have many different voices telling those stories. Mm -hmm. Because for a long time, and this is one of the reasons that Afrofuturism actually was always super curious to me, because I r once remember reading somewhere that Afrofuturism came about because we know we didn't have the ability to tell our stories in the past. So now we begin to tell our stories in the future. We've taken ownership. Stories will always be told. The authors will always be different. Our role now as Africans and our role as people of color is to add and inject our voices into them so that there is diversity in the telling of the stories. Mm. But we're not, we don't own the mechanisms. We don't own the studios. We don't own the brands. But that doesn't mean that we can't inject it with our own ethos mm -hmm. or our own ideas or our own identity so that it feels relevant and grounded and full of love and joy and just pride in what we've achieved as a continent, even if it's told through the eyes of, a f of an imaginary nation. Mm. And what do you think the success of Black Panther means uh, for African filmmakers and even African film audiences? What might this impart into the future of filmmaking? I think the success of Black Panther is, is great, and not only for um, African filmmakers, but just for people of color. We finally showed, despite all the studies and despite all of the rhetoric, that black films can be watched and have a commercial success. That's mm. amazing. And then more importantly, it had local languages in it. We had a Marvel film with, a l with local African languages in it. And people were not turned off by it. They were not turned away by it. They embraced the film as a whole, mm -hmm. despite what people have thought of as obstacles before. So I think it's a time, and, and, and also, it shines a light on Africa. So Black Panther not only has become this phenomenon in the Marvel Universe or in as, as a result of an um, American studio system, but it's actually shone light on Afrofuturist artists yeah. in Africa. Yeah. So there's lots of Afrofuturist Af uh, African artists that are coming up who people are seeing and people are acknowledging because of their work. And that wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for Black Panther. Mm. 
I mean, some say that Black Panther is also a product of the time that we're in, where there seems to be a greater focus on black issues, uh, the black agenda, whether it's in art or in politics. Do you think, and maybe it's a bit crass to put it this way, but black is fashionable at the moment, that black is the new black? Even if, let's say black were to become fashionable, I think it's high time. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, I will take it for all it's worth because we've, we've been needing this attention. And, and, and not only because the continent of Africa is seen as a, uh, not e it's, it's, see, it's still seen as the third world mm. or the developing world, as if there's, we will never measure up mm. to the standards of others. Right. Mm -hmm. Not only for that reason, so that we are able to be seen with the same amount of equality, humanity, mm -hmm. joy, love as anybody else. We know, of course, that there's a massive appetite for, for film in Africa, and just by virtue of the regional film industries uh, like Nollywood. Have these become, or can these become the platform or the vehicle to tell the kind of stories that we, you know, where we put African characters at the center in non-stereotypical roles? I think that there's a great opportunity for local film industries to start pushing the envelope because there's always been a history of that kind of filmmaking everywhere else in the world. Uh, in America, you would have the straight-to-DVD or uh, the hallmark straight-to-TV films. Mm. And that's basically what Nollywood or Riverwood or the other woods are uh, in Africa. And what they do is that they help train people and how to tell stories better using this medium. Mm -hmm. Because there is a very particular formula you mm -hmm. use to create a good film. Mm -hmm. So the ability, the, the thing about filmmaking is that the more you practice, the better you at it you become. So what these local industries are, uh, are giving us opportunities is to harness our story making skills. Mm -hmm. And once we have that, or once we have just a very basic knowledge about how to tell good stories, then we can start telling even more incredible stories and even greater stories that, uh, that challenge the stereotypes that we are, we're used to and also start to s challenge the patriarchal systems that still exist within the continent. Mm -hmm. And that's true. I mean, I think that's one thing about Black Panther that was quite encouraging was the depiction of women as strong, as intelligent, certainly something that I imagine many, especially female audiences, really appreciated about it. Yeah, it was great to see female warriors, people fighting alongside men. And it was also great to see that the African, uh, it was also great to see that actors who came from Africa or who have links to Africa or who have generally been part of the, di the diaspora play central parts in these films. Mm. Because so often they, be they become background extras in American films. But this time there was very much a need to have African people with of, of African descent as key roles in 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 Black Panther, mm. and that that just I think that also added to the texture and authenticity of it, is that we had a great many number of accents and flavor and people and and just even the way they held themselves. There was something about their very presence that felt like it was organic to the place it that was it was mm. being shot. Mm. So it's I th it's just Black Panther was. <laughs> was great. I loved it. It absolutely was. Yeah. And do you think in that respect that sometimes creatives are a few steps ahead of perhaps the industry itself, which is still supporting images of the hungry, desperate, starving Africans, so or even audiences that are sometimes compelled to you know, absorb those, those images? Yeah, I think artists have always been at the forefront. It's been our history. It's been our, it's been our role. And not now, but traditionally, even, even when we were uh, seers and storytellers in the past, and in, in, in the oral history that we know about ourselves, we would, we would be the ones who would tell of the coming of things. In the Koya tradition, there was a man, there was a seer called Mogo, and he was the first person to, to say that there are white people coming. And he saw them in the, in the image of butterflies, so he saw the coming of others onto the continent before we could articulate it in, mm. in policy or in law or in any other way. There's been a great history of storytellers across the continent who are not only uh, the seers of the future, but also are responsible for the personal histories. So when you go to a funeral, there's a person who's able to say, this is this person's daughter 
who's this person's granddaughter, who's this person's great granddaughter, and give us a lineage mm -hmm. of where we came from. Those things, the ability to see into the future and into the past and have those things as a storyteller has always been part of us. So now we're just bringing it into this future century that we're in mm -hmm. and applying it to what we know now in the life we know now. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, if you go back to the, to the question of patriarchy, it, it definitely matters um, for, for women, for, for me, for instance, to, to see African film directors, filmmakers behind the stories that inspire and move um, to be the ones writing these scripts and writing these narratives that are not subject to this idea of this is a woman's place. Um, what is your kind of, what do you, what, wh how would you see yourself as an inspiration to, to, to future writers and filmmakers on the continent? Uh, I think that the only inspiration I can be is, is, is the, the idea that I, I exist and I, and I work <laughs> because that's what gives me hope. I look at other people who are working and who are creating. Uh, women like Nnedi Okarafor, who's a Nigerian-American writer. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o, who's, who's an amazing actress and, and becoming a producer as well. I look at them and I think they have the ability to be and work and therefore I have the ability to be and work. And hopefully, if people see my work, then they will realize that they are capable of it too. Mm -hmm. Because in the very same way that I realize that I can make film and TV, maybe other people will realize that they have an opportunity to do the same. And all I can do is present possibilities or possible futures to people, as in science fiction would, mm -hmm. in a science fiction sense, is present different possibilities to different young women to show that they can be so much more than what they're usually told they can be. And they can imagine so much more and, and just thrive in, in ways that are so unexpected. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and my plan is to support that, is to support it in any way that I can. And then where does Afro Bubblegum fit in in all of this, in terms of the future of not only your filmmaking, but the potential of the continent stories uh, to be told to global and, and worldwide audiences? Well, with Afro Bubblegum, what we're trying to do is to curate, commission, and create fun, fierce, and frivolous art. So we're trying to great create links between Pan-African artists where they can start to have conversations with each other, they can start to collaborate with each other, and also start forcing images to be used by others of us. So that when we refer to Africa, we think of joyful images that are done by amazing artists like Letitia Kay, or Des Dennis Osadebe, or there's so many interesting young artists coming out now that we want to be able to be the representatives, the ambassadors of what is Africa, so that when we see them, we think, oh, what a joyful place. Mm. What a great place to be. How I would want to be with those people. And also for Africans to think, oh, I want to meet other Africans like me or who have similar joy cultures to the ones that I do. Mm -hmm. So the idea of afro is to firmly push a joyful agenda into the world. Mm. And are there any current projects you're willing to, to, to tell us about in terms of afro -Bubblegum? Yeah, afro has a, a great many amount of projects coming up. We have a feature film that we're releasing shortly that will be, uh, we hope to release in May, called Rafiki. And we also have um, a music compilation and a couple of podcasts to look at later on this year. Yes, but we're also collaborating with many different artists from across the continent to be able to just um, give visibility to the idea of joy in different spaces. Wonderful, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much, Vanuri, for your time and your insights. Well, that's all we have time for on this week's edition of Talk Africa. Now remember, you can join the conversation online through Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And tune in again next week. From me, Lindy Mtongana, goodbye.